On behalf of the Computer History Museum, it is my privilege to welcome Scott McNeely. He doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he was co-founder of Sun and which changed the world. My name is Uday Kapoor and I am a volunteer at the Computer History Museum's Oral Histories Program. And I have the added pleasure of privilege having worked for Sun for more than 20 years. So with that, welcome. Thanks. And uh, I'd like to start with your early life. Uh, you were born on November 13, 1954 in Columbus, Indiana. And to an illustrious father, uh, Bill McNeely, who was a senior manager and then later rose to vice chairman at uh, American Motors. So could you please tell us about your early life? Well, my early life was uh, moving around a lot. I was in eight schools by eighth grade. <clears throat> lived in uh, Indiana and then uh, moved to Rockford, Illinois, then to Kansas City, Missouri, then to Racine, Wisconsin, and then eventually we ended up in Michigan, which is where I spent my high school years. And my dad uh, moved around a lot of different jobs, a Harvard MBA, and met my mom, who was a flight attendant, hostess back then on TWA, and I had uh, two brothers and a sister, and uh, finally I went off to Harvard, worked there, uh, or went to school there for four years, studied economics. So we'll come back to that. Yeah. So in the early days, um, uh, since you were born in Indiana, and then you really spent your school years in uh, Michigan, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and you went to a a very prestigious uh, elite prep school called Cranbrook, where Mitt Romney also attended. So in between, uh, what was what happened? You know, how did you go up to Michigan? Well, we, we uh, basically just followed my dad around, and he worked for different companies. And eventually, he got a job as a head of purchasing for American Motors, one of the big four automakers at the time, in uh, Racine, Wisconsin, Kenosha, actually. And, and then uh, he got promoted to uh, Detroit to go run uh, a piece of the marketing organization. So we all moved to Detroit. That's how I ended up there. Okay. Thank you. And I understand you, you were around bright people in the school. It's an elite school. And uh, you were very active in sports. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I never was the brightest kid in the room, but I loved being around bright people. Uh, at Cranbrook, I uh, lettered in uh, I was captain of the state champion tennis team. I was assistant captain of the hockey team. And uh, I was uh, top 15 in the state in uh, golf on the golf team. And I was most valuable member of the band, even though I was a terrible musician. But uh, that was my deal. I wasn't the smartest kid in the room, but I was good at a lot of different things. Thank you. And then, uh, then you went on to Harvard. You gained entrance to Harvard as a pre-medical student, I understand. And if it was your father's alma mater, so uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that experience? Yeah, well, my dad and his three brothers all went to Harvard and all got graduate degrees from Harvard. And I got into Stanford and Harvard, and my mom said, go out to Stanford and be a playboy. My dad said, go out to Harvard and make something of yourself. And uh, the responsible part of me went out, and I went to Harvard and uh, started off in uh, in uh, a pre-med role, but I noticed about 60% of the class was pre-med, and I thought, well, there's plenty of doctors, and I fell in love with the economics, and uh, my economics professor, Bill Reduschel, who to this day is a uh, best friend, godfather to one of my children, was in my wedding. He was uh, just about everything uh, in the staff roles at Sun Microsystems, CFO, CR HRO, CIO, head of strategy chief financial officer and uh, so it was a, yes. a very fortuitous decision for him. Yes, me. I understand he played a big role in your career. And life. In life. Um, also you overlapped with Bill Gates although you never really uh, met him there uh, at Harvard. Well I did uh, <coughs> run into uh, Steve Ballmer. He came in to Harvard a year later and actually uh, came to my dorm room. I think he might have even spent the night in my dorm room when he was visiting. He was from a crosstown rival uh, high school in Michigan called uh, Country Day, Detroit Country Day, and uh, so I did get to know him in uh, very early days. Very good. Um, <clears throat> then you graduated from Harvard in 1976 with a BA, uh, and uh, you <laughs> said that your main interests were beer and uh, golf, and you captained the Harvard's golf team, in fact. Right. So your sports career continued. 
Yeah, well, it kind of ended abruptly. I uh, hit, hit one out of bounds on the 17th hole, and I missed going to the NCAA championships my senior year. Then I had to find a job because I was graduating in two weeks, and uh, eventually my old hockey coach from Michigan hired me in at Rockwell International Automotive Operations in their plastics division, sort of like the graduate where they told the kid plastics, so right. I went into plastics. Right. So then you worked at AMC for some time in the plastics? I worked for Rockwell International. AMC was, was a potential customer, but uh, no, I didn't work for Dad. He, he, he knew better than to hire me. So, and I also worked for Roger Penske in the summers. Uh, my first job was $1.75 an hour, uh, wash boy and uh, car porter in uh, Penske Chevrolet in Southfield, Michigan. Right. I understand you, uh, your father played a big role in your uh, education in terms of, you know, you used to study his files, uh, you know, and uh, you learned a lot from that. Files were a little different thing back then. I would, he would come home and have a Manhattan and sit in his chair and uh, empty out his briefcase reading it and making notes and I would sit down at the foot of his chair and w watch what he threw in the you know, forward file in the trash and in the uh, save file, and I would uh, ask him questions about it and say, why did you do this? What's this all about? And uh, he, he was nice enough to help me out a little bit. Uh, after that, uh, were you looking to continue your education uh, in the uh, business field? Yeah, I'd sort of always thought I should get an MBA, and so I tried for uh, the first two years uh, right out of college and uh, my first year out of uh, college while I was at Rockwell to get into Harvard and Stanford and I got into neither. Then finally the third year while I was still working at Rock Rockwell International I got into the Stanford Business School. I didn't finish the Harvard application and I went to the Stanford Business School. And I understand that you were one of the few MBA students concentrating on manufacturing. Yeah, I took all three classes that Stanford offered in the business school on manufacturing. Seems to me the Stanford Business School is much more interested in teaching ethics and uh, public policy these days and uh, manufacturing was, wasn't a, a big big deal even then. Right. So <clears throat> what aspect of uh, management in manufacturing did they emphasize? What, what do you remember? Um, very little. Uh, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I don't think an MBA is a, a very applicable uh, discipline for graduate school because you don't do anything that you do. If you're a chemist, you do chemistry. If you're a ph physician, you smash atoms. At business school, you don't raise any money, spend any money. You don't hire, review, or fire anybody. You don't design anything. You don't make anything. You don't sell anything. And you do nothing that you do in the real life, but I met a lot of really bright people. That was the real advantage. It was a pretty expensive way to meet really bright people. Maybe about finance. Um, Even that. I learned a few accounting words that I, you know, certainly uh, you can learn online today very quickly and very easily and very cheaply. So you graduated from Stanford in 1980 with an MBA, and apparently then you went to work for FMC. I was dying to go back into the factory. I love making things. I love taking raw materials, adding some labor and some process and some, and putting it in a box and shipping it out for more money than it cost. To, it just seemed to me that was real life. And I couldn't get a job in a manufacturing environment. Every time I interview a manufacturer, they said, no, you're too important and too educated to put in the factory. And I'm thinking, how do you learn about a business other than actually getting in there and building the product? Finally, FMC Corporation said, we'll put you on the corporate manufacturing staff in Chicago doing strategy, and then in a couple of years, we'll move you into the factory. So I went with FMC Corporation. So their manufacturing was here in San Jose? Well, they have many they have all around the world, and uh, I fell in love with a secretary out here at the San Jose tank plant where they built Bradley fighting vehicles. And uh, I told him either you move me out to California or I quit. So I'm, they moved me out here and I worked in the factory. I uh, was a plant scheduler in the factory and, and then 10 months later got into the computer industry. Right. So <clears throat> while you were working there, uh, I guess Bill Reduschel approached you for a position at Onyx? That's correct. He uh, was buying the computers. He was working, I believe, for an econometrics firm for Otto Eckstein. 
and he was trying to buy computers and uh, they couldn't ship them fast enough so he called the CEO Doug Broyles and uh, I went over and interviewed with them and they gave me the job basically on Bill Reduschel's recommendation. I didn't know what a computer was, I didn't know what a disk drive did, I didn't, was not an engineer um, and uh, it was a, a pretty fortuitous uh, step into the Silicon Valley for me. So were you looking for a change or you thought that was a good opportunity? You know, um, I remember walking in and seeing, yeah, I came from the car business and the tank business and I remember them showing me the Onyx computer which was the first computer to put Unix on a microprocessor and it was a little box not much bigger than a very small suitcase. I lifted the cover off and I, I said how much do the components cost in this thing? And the guy says, oh, about $3,000. I said, what do you sell it for? He says, $25,000. I said, really? How long does it take you to make them? Oh, about five hours. And then we let them run for two days, and if they don't break, we ship them. I said, are you kidding me? This is like stealing, because I know how hard it was to design and build a car and the gross margins and all, and I thought, this is like stealing. I'm in. So that's, that's why I made the shift from building tanks to building uh, building uh, computers. Okay. So you were there for a little bit of time and then apparently in 1982 Vinod Khosla called you uh, apparently to uh, look at the Onyx CEO as a venture capitalist uh, for what their startup was. Well Vinod and I went to business school together so we graduated in 80 together and he and I became good friends because he was always the last guy at the party. I don't ask me why I know but uh, we became good buddies and then after we actually started a company before Sun called the data dump and Vinod doesn't like to talk about this but uh, we thought it would be a good idea to put four phase mini computers near uh, campuses and allow timeshare availability for word processing not realizing that all of a sudden everybody's going to own their own PC and do their word processing that way so the data dump Boom, we lost Carl Berg, a big developer. We lost all his money there, but Carl also invested through uh, Doug Broyles, who was the former Onyx CEO, into Sun. So he kind of cut us some slack because he made a lot of money on Sun Microsystems as one of the original investors. Right. So he approached you, Vinod approached you uh, for the position at uh, the startup. Well, he actually called and said, hey, I met this guy, Andreas von Bechtelsheim, who's invented the Stanford University Network Workstation. He said, we can start a company. Do you know any venture capitalists? And I said, well, Doug. Let's go be Doug Broyles at, uh, oh gosh, West Coast Ventures at the time. And um, Carl Berg was the big investor in West Coast Ventures. And so we went and I introduced him. I showed him the Sun Workstation that Andy had done. And within a half hour, Doug said, sure, I'll invest. And so I took Vinod over to the McDonald's right here um, uh, at, uh, what's it called, uh, Sand Hill, uh, not Sand Hill, uh, Page Mill and uh, El Camino. And I, I said, congrats, you got money now from Bob Sackman at U.S. Venture Partners and uh, Doug Broyles, congratulations. And he goes, well, are you going to quit tomorrow? I go, what are you talking about? He said, you can't back out on me now. I go, back out on you, I don't have a job offer. He says, you're a founder. Oh, all right, so I went in the next day and quit. And they all told me I was absolutely nuts and right. the rest is history. So that's amazing that that's where history was made because you know you came from a manufacturing background, had no intention of going into you know, computers or anything. And here was really the beginning of a fantastic career. You know, the, uh, somebody wrote a book. I never read it because I lived it. It's called Accidental Empires and it's all about how companies get started here in the Valley. Yeah, when I started off, I was just doing, I, I was in charge of sales and I was in charge of manufacturing and I was in charge of, I actually used VI, Unix VI, to write the uh, first ERP system we used and uh, I assigned all the part numbers and I built the shelves and I put the boxes in the shelves, I labeled the boxes and I put the parts in and then I went and paid the bills. So it was uh, So the <coughs> target was to compete with the VAX 750 and 780? Actually, the target was, our main competitor at the time was Apollo, who was also doing workstations, and then the CAD companies were building their own workstations, so we were always trying to get them to use ours and, and become software companies. Right. So, <clears throat> in, 
beginning you uh, depended on the design from Sun or SUN from Stanford and it was based on the Motorola 68000 um, and adding that uh, to was Unix uh, and also which you then got Bill Joy from Berkeley uh, and also the uh, networking uh, protocols so uh, this was a very unique uh, creative design we, we like to call it building a Ferrari using off-the-shelf components. So we use standard Motorola microprocessors, standard power supplies, Fujitsu disk drives. Uh, I can't remember who was our DRAM supplier. Uh, but then we also uh, used software that was off-the-shelf, so we got the Berkeley Unix, which is what Bill Joy brought. Uh, we used TCP IP, which was an open source networking stack. And that, we were the, probably the first computer company to ever put TCP IP on every computer that we shipped as silly as that sounds, but uh, it, w there was DECnet, there was IBM's SNA, there was uh, Apollo had their own, and I can't remember what it was called. There was the Novell networking schemes, LAN manager from Microsoft. There were dozens and dozens of network protocols and turned out that uh, TCP IP beat them all, didn't it? Right, so <clears throat> you were uh, VP of uh, manufacturing and operations. Uh, and uh, at that time, Vinod was the CEO uh, running the company. Uh, and apparently, that didn't work out too well uh, in the next couple of years he, he left. Uh, but you had to take over as the CEO. Uh, in between, there was a person by the name of Owen Brown, apparently, mm -hmm. who was the COO. Yeah, I think the board the board sort of was a little green. It was one of, I think one of John Doerr's first ever board. You know, one of the greatest venture capitalists of all time. I mean, he really is. And I think we were all sort of learning our way around. We had four 27 year olds who had founded the company and were running it. And I had three years business experience, which was more than the other three founders combined. Uh, Vin Vinod uh, was not seasoned, and the board wanted to bring in a president. <laughs> Uh, with him as chairman, so we got a guy from uh, digital equipment. Unfortunately, we sort of had a mom and dad thing. If dad said no, you go to mom, and if mom said no, you went to dad and tried to get the answers, and it just wasn't clear leadership, and so the board saw there was a lot of opportunity, but a lot of problems, so literally two years into it to the day, uh, on February 24th, 1984, they uh, basically, Owen and Vinod were relieved of their duties and they asked me to take over temporarily until they went out and find, found a new CEO. The staff voted eight to nothing, go out and get a new guy because Scott's not capable. And over the next 10, 15 months we solved a lot of problems um, and things started to run pretty well and we found a, somebody to bring in from Hewlett Packard and um, the board explained that, we explained that to the staff who was coming in, uh, Kodak said we're not investing. They had committed, I think, to invest $20 million in the company. When they heard who it was, they knew him, and they said we're not investing. The whole thing was about to blow up. The, the Kodak guy came out, uh, their operations guy, Dick Kleinhens, interviewed everybody, talked to everybody, uh, asked my staff, they voted 11 to nothing 10 months later to keep me as CEO, not bring in the new guy. So he went to the board and he said, we'll invest under two conditions. One, Scott stays CEO, and two, uh, we have a five-year veto vote on any new CEO if you try to replace Scott. And the board said, okay, we'll keep Scott. My staff was happy. And, the, and then Dick Kleinhans sat down quietly and he said, do you want the job? I go, well, I don't know. He goes, well, if you take it, you know, buck up, take control, be the boss, stop being wimpy, take over. And, and he really kind of kicked my butt big time and said, be a CEO and stop being so wimpy. And, so this was also the time when you hired a lot of uh, creative people and uh, fantastic people. So maybe you can name a few now. Oh my gosh, there were so many good people. And, and you know, the one guy who probably gets very little credit here in the techie Silicon Valley was Crawford Beveridge. He was my hire for VP of HR. And he was my confidant, my right-hand man. He was my trainer, my educator, my developer. He kind of, very senior, wonderful guy from Scotland, and uh, he helped us bring in Carol Bartz and uh, Bernie LaCroote and uh, 
oh gosh, I'm going to remember a whole bunch of the names, Bob Lux and uh, all of the finance people. He, he made people comfortable that this young kid wasn't a wacko. And then on the technical side, Bill and Andy just kept bringing in all of the superstars like uh, the, the Tom Lyons or Pugs as he was, he was known, James Gosling uh, obviously, and then relationships with guys like Patterson and other folks. I mean, it, there's, it's just too hard to name all of the brilliant, brilliant people there. Uh, and, and, you know, A people hire A plus people and, and it, just, it just took off. Right. And uh, on the product side, at that time you were designing with the Motorola and apparently with Intel architecture as well in the beginning? I think we started with a Motorola, and then I think we did Intel a little bit later. We did one experiment. We built a 98% compatible Intel computer. That, would, that didn't go very well. Um, you know, we made a lot of mistakes in the early days. We did a lot of things right. We, uh, we were, had Route D running on Sun OS on our computers. People would take the monitor off and use it as a, a router. We never went after that business. Cisco happened. But Bill Joy came in one day and said, we can build a better microprocessor with my buddy Patterson, and they invented the first Sun RISC architecture, Spark, and uh, that became a massive success. So, so when did the move to Spark happen, or at the beginning, or the decision on Spark? I, I, well, I think we started shipping in 89, so it was probably like 85 or so, 86 when we decided Sun to make that Sun went public in 86, so right. it was, uh, that decision was made before Sun went public. Yeah, I think so. I can't remember. That's sure. a long time no ago, but, you know, it was, it, things were happening fast, and uh, the good news is I wasn't an engineer, so I didn't get in their way. Right. We have done a lot of panel discussions on that, so we, so I, you know, don't expect you to go into any details. That's fine. Uh, so at 1986, Sun went public, and that year the uh, revenues were 8.5 million dollars, and um, I have the. Uh, from I think if I remember the numbers correctly, the first year we, 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 we were, we started in February of 1982, we went profitable in May, and the first fiscal year, July 1st through uh, June 30th, we did eight, eight and a half million, then we did 39 million, then we did 115 million, then we did about 210 Ten. million, and then we did 450, four, 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 around 450, and then a billion the next year. In 1991. Yeah, so that's, that's the ramp, and right. that was, that was, Real revenue, it was, it was as crazy as it gets. I know, so with that kind of a growth, you must be growing the staff, you must be doing a lot of stuff to you know, achieve that. The only way we could do that was to architect and distribute, to delegate, uh, to uh, be participative but not consensus, and uh, to ask is to seek denial. Right. Uh, I was one of the guys that uh, at Cyprus we did the first Spark chip right. after the Gatorade. So uh, I met a lot of the people at that time, so I know the environment a little bit. Um, and then uh, I think Sun ran into some production problems uh, with the very broad product line that you had at that time. And you moved your office to the factory floor, apparently, to, to really get into it. That happened more than once, <laughs> and you know, really, uh, one of the things that really helped me out was going on the board of uh, GE, and I saw the focus that Jack Welch put on quality and Six Sigma, and you know, that. And then the second thing is his focus on hiring and reviewing and managing people. He spent most of his time doing those two things. I'll tell you a third key success factor for us was I grew up in the auto industry and I remember one day my dad came home and at American Motors and said, oh my gosh, I've just seen, I've seen the enemy and it's the Honda Civic. And he could not believe how high quality the car was, how uh, high performance it was for the dollar. And he said, this is going to be a problem. And nobody else in Detroit saw Jap Japan coming as early as he did. And I thought to myself, holy mackerel, we're doing great here in the computer industry, but Japan's coming on with NEC, with Fujitsu, with uh, Toshiba, with all of these uh, computer companies. I said, we'd better go compete. So I started, I went to Japan probably once a quarter for about six years trying to build our business there, and Japan beat us up, and they would look at every one of our machines, and they would tell us everything that was wrong, and then we'd go back and fix it. 
and I thought if we can win in Pearl Harbor, you know, in uh, Tokyo Harbor, we won't have our own Pearl Harbor in the computer industry. So that happened, and I think uh, we ended up uh, getting all of the major computer companies to resell our product, and uh, we became that became our largest and most profitable subsidiary, and I think to a large degree helped us. Uh, hold off the uh, the Japanese uh, and the momentum that they had at that point. Right. So, <clears throat> not only did you solve the factory problem, uh, apparently you pruned the product line at that time and concentrated on the spark-based product, and also reorganized to the planets. So maybe. Oh my God! There's two things that happened. One I did well, and the other one I didn't do so well. You know the. It was all the wood behind one arrowhead was getting everybody into one architecture, one strategy. We we're going to push it real hard, and we we're going to focus. And, and I remember the arrow that was put in your yeah, office. Yeah, we had a 60-foot <laughs> arrow that went through the fourth floor of uh, w what is now the uh, uh, Jewish Center that they have over there. But um, it was quite a scene to see an arrow that went all the way through the building on the fourth floor and right through my office. But uh, uh, we also did some reorgs that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't and the planet reorganization didn't work. The thought was that we would organize like a chip company, a software company, a systems company, a services company, and a retail company and it didn't work. I just had too many people fighting too many people so we got back to a more traditional org, org structure. Right. So you uh, then Sun passed the three billion dollar revenue mark in 1992 uh, and at that time it was still uh, workstation uh, centric and one of the key areas of course because that's how you started was the EDA uh, uh, domain. What were the other domains? Well, you know, the, uh, a lot of customers were taking our servers and or our workstations and taking the monitor off and just running them as servers and running them as file servers and database servers and other things and so we thought well why don't we just get into the server business and so we started building real life servers. We started off with two way, four way and eventually we bought uh, the Cray supercomputer sold us their 64 way uh, uh, ultra spark, super spark computer and we bought it for about 15 million and it turned out to be a multi-billion dollar business. It was one of the great acquisitions. DOS was a little better acquisition but uh, this one was a pretty darn good acquisition and that got us into the server business big right. time. So, uh, Initially, you were, as you said, using the workstation technology as servers, but then you also seriously went into the server business. Uh, I talked to David Yen a lot, so right. some of the technology from Xerox and so on. Maybe you can spend a few minutes on that. Well, you know, it was it was nice because we had all the pieces. We had the microprocessor, we had the computer manufacturing and design business, we had the operating system, we had the networking protocols. Uh, and the systems management software. So we had all of the pieces to go out and compete and we had a real advantage in the sense that we were open source. We had uh, open interfaces and uh, I would always tell customers that we had a low barrier to exit which uh, was a, a very safe buy uh, and as opposed to getting locked into a mainframe or a VAX environment or uh, into a Microsoft environment where you fundamentally, once you got locked in, you were sort of stuck. Right. So the <clears throat> competition in the Unix servers, uh, there was SGI and uh, who else was there? Well, there were a lot of people doing Unix. We happened to be the number one Unix and uh, eventually Hewlett Packard, DEC and IBM got upset with us and they decided to form a consortium, OSF, uh, Open Software Foundation. I called it a Poe's Sun Forever Foundation. <laughs> and they tried to gang up. So then we went to AT&T and we merged Berkeley Unix with System 5 Release 4 and uh, created a, a, a merged uh, Unix that had much greater volume and we ended up kicking OSF's butt. Pretty good on that one, but uh, that But was in terms of volume, uh, you were still behind the Wintel volume, uh, apparently. Uh, volume was always a, a bigger issue depending on how many transactions, if you looked at it in terms of the number of transactions you drove or the amount of business processes you ran or the amount of Oracle licenses that you ran. Uh, we weren't a desktop volume player because we always had workstations and then uh, enterprise servers. But uh, yeah, volume was, was always a bigger, the biggest deal we had was, was Intel on the microprocessor. They had such high volume uh, and the binary uh, 
the binary uh, capture that they got of people compiling to their chips was a big issue, which is why Java was such a big thing right. for us and a big breakthrough. So we'll come to that. But at that time, uh, Microsoft announced the Windows NT and uh, then Windows 95. And so there was uh, you know, added pressure on, on Sun to come up with the project. Oh, there was always pressure on yes. Sun. And <laughs> the most favorite project code name in the industry was Eclipse. Everybody wanted to eclipse Sun. We were rocking and rolling and, and uh, uh, winning. We, we had won the application developer war with just about every one of the key developers. But then there was the Windows environment and Windows wanted to try to move their desktop environment into the uh, NT server space. Uh, you know, that was marginally successful. They certainly spent a lot of money on it. Right. But you had uh, already coined the, uh, your team had already coined the dot in the dot com boom uh, phrase. And uh, so you were getting a lot of buzz. And so there was certainly conflict with Microsoft at that time. Uh, there wasn't conflict, there was friendly competition. Competition. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, certainly they were getting buzz with NT and also Windows 95. and. So uh, I think there was a move uh, on Sun's part to uh, work with some other uh, companies to have an antitrust action against uh, Microsoft because of the monopoly. Uh, so uh, could you say a few words about that? Yeah, that wasn't really a, a move with other people. We basically uh, uh, went after them for taking some of the Java class libraries and renaming them and dropping some of the other class libraries out of their developer kit, which was destroying one of the great features of Java, which was write ones run anywhere. So that was really what we went after them for, and, and uh, we had a settlement that um, so, basically resolved So maybe that. I just step forward a little bit. So, so you needed a, uh, it's called a magic ring, and so the Java was uh, developed, initially started off as a project called Oak uh, that uh, James Gosling's team were doing uh, to for distributed computing. And then uh, in 1994, uh, there was a little bit of frustration and there was some fear that James' uh, team was going to quit. And uh, Eric Schmidt uh, made a presentation with them on Java uh, applets and pages on the World Wide Web and how they could add motion and uh, you know full-blown Java applications for business applications and I think you heard that and that made a you know a big showing. I, well I do remember when Eric came in and showed us the browser and that was a, a big eye-opener he had uh, he brought over the Netscape browser that uh, Mark Andreessen was, or the Mosaic browser, I think it was at the time, I can't remember, and that was a big, but uh, Oak actually started because, um, you know, we had recruited James because Bill Joy called him the greatest programmer in the world, and when the greatest programmer in the world calls somebody else the greatest programmer in the world, you know you got a great programmer, so James came on board, and I heard a rumor in the grapevine that he was going to leave, and I went, oh, crap, he can't do that. So I called James, I called him in my office, and I said, what's up? He goes, well, I'm, I want to work on some consumer technology. I want to get out in there in the volume. Consumer is driving the, driving the technology, not the enterprise. And uh, so I'm going to leave and go do something. And I said, no, you're not. He said, what do you mean? I said, James, anything you want to do, anywhere you want to do it, forever, for how long you want to do it, with whom you want to do it, for as much as it costs, I will fund it. I will protect you. I will make sure that you can go do whatever you want to go do. But all I ask is you come back to me in a week with a back of the envelope business plan about where and what you want to go do. And then I ask that you come visit me once a year and tell me how you're doing. That's it. You can't leave. You're going to go do this. I don't care what it is. It can be anything. He looks at me and says, really? I said, yeah, now get out of here. He smiled, got up, walked out. A week later, he came in and started Oak, and then it turned into Green, and then he was going to build a universal controller, but then he needed a language and an operating environment to do it, so he invented Java. Then all of a sudden, uh, Andreessen and James decided to marry the 
Mosaic Netscape browser with the Java VM. We had the distribution channel and uh, Ed Zander did a brilliant job of launching it and uh, the rest is history. So, <clears throat> so, so nice that he stayed. Uh, you know, he just got the um, award as a fellow from the museum and uh, universally recognized as a you know, fantastic genius. The, uh, the unknown piece of it is four times uh, the Java project was taken out of the budget in the cost-cutting exercise by different folks and four times I put it back in. That's my only claim to fame on, on uh, Java is that I just trusted James and I was not going, and I committed to him we were going to follow through and so I did not let anybody uh, take that out of the budget. So Netscape played a key role in the distribution and making it widely available. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, your strategy was to have it uh, in the Windows uh, with Microsoft. So after a lot of work, I think they agreed, but uh, as you said earlier, uh, they were really not serious because they wanted to uh, you know, change it for their own purposes. True. So, and so, uh, meanwhile, uh, for the uh, Java campaign, you know, you, there's a famous uh, poster of yours with the Java man ring, and uh, that was, uh, you know, quite fantastic. And Kleiner Perkins started a $100 million fund to support Java. Correct. Um, well, Java won the developer conference, I think at the time was the largest developer conference in the world. Right. Um, so Java essentially established Sun as a leader in the internet-based uh, technology. And uh, I think at some point Sun sued Microsoft for the breach of contract. That was in 97, in 1997. Uh, and Sun, under your leadership, became the foremost innovative leader in the IT industry. Um, in 2000, so uh, the sales continued to grow. Um, and then in the year 2000, uh, you know, the dot-com bust happened. And everything came crashing down. I still remember, because I joined Sun in 99. And I, I remember running into John Shoemaker and the uh, in the restroom, and I said, how are things? He says, I don't know, nobody's buying anything. <laughs> so I remember that time, you know, it was, um, so maybe you could say a few words about that. And well, it was clearly uh, um, the first, well, it wasn't the first time, but you know, the industry had always gone through bubbles like that, but that was the first time we got caught. We had filled the channel with, with uh, too much inventory, and f for a year, people were selling our boxes on the gray market that had been sitting in warehouses, that sort of thing, and it made it very, very challenging. We, we grew too fast, we grew expenses too quickly, and uh, we just assumed that everything was constantly gonna go up and to the right, and it doesn't, doesn't work that way. Everybody has their slowdowns, and so we learned a lot about that and uh, recovered nicely and uh, turned, turned the business around and got it growing again, and uh, we're generating cash, and had very good margins, so it was just a, a challenging, challenging moment in economic. It was Y2K and the dot-com bubble, uh, and and then in 9/11 the terrorist uh, attack happened, which exacerbated the economic exactly. conditions. Uh, so the technology spending plummeted. Uh, exactly, and Sun faced increased competition in the cheaper server market or the Lintel, uh, Linux space. Uh, so that's an interesting um, sidebar. When we did the deal with AT&T to take SunOS and merge it with AT&T to create Solaris, AT&T would not let us open source because they didn't believe in that. That's our corporate jewels. They've always grown up that Bell Labs patents stuff and it's not open. And, uh, and as a result, we went about five or six years where Solaris was proprietary. Uh, and during that time, Linux got started because people wanted an open source OS. And Sun OS was open source, but Solaris wasn't. And it wasn't until five or six years later, we spent a lot of money with Novell and uh, a lot of money reverse engineering out all of the AT&T stuff to where we could reissue Solaris as an open source architecture. But by then, Linux, Linux had happened. Linux had made a lot of gains. Yep. Um, 
So by 2004, Sun faced uh, 12 consecutive quarters of declining revenue. And uh, they were like $13.6 billion revenue in 2004. And uh, because of a lot of the negative press, um, Sun could not return to profitability. Uh, in April 2004, Sun Microsoft called a truce. I remember a lot of the negotiations that used to be happening, and uh, uh, there was a, uh, somebody ran into Bill Gates in the restroom or something. He was shocked, you know. I remember. So maybe you could say a few words if you like. You know, I, there there was nothing um, that hasn't been written up very very uh, well. I don't have any any. Uh, special color on that. I think it was just both companies doing their best to try and uh, protect their shareholders and uh, protect their business um, strategy. So it was, it, was a, it was a good fair fight. Right. And then uh, Greg Papadopoulos was working with Bill Gates about uh, the roadmaps and how to work together. We worked with everybody and we competed with lots of people. So it was a very, uh, very open um, environment that way and a lot of people doing lots of different things that we were very we were doing everything from chips to uh, services and everything in between so right we touched a lot of companies so a lot of the analysts in the industry read the deal as a capitulation by you and <laughs> that you know you gave into because you know you were so feisty until then I don't know if it was a capitulation the 2.4 billion dollar settlement is the largest antitrust settlement in the history of anything I believe so I think we I think we walked away pretty well. Right. And there was also speculation that maybe you wanted to uh, hand the reins over to you know your successor. At that I've time. wanted to do that from day one. In fact, when I took over in 1984, before I said yes, based on the Dick Kleinhans meeting and before I said yes to the board, I went home, had dinner with my mom. I was single at the time and I didn't know who else to talk to. I said, Mom, I don't really want to be CEO. It's too hard to work. I saw how hard dad worked, and I'm not sure. I'd, I'd love to be a good number two, a COO type or whatever, but I don't want to be the lead dog. Uh, and she said, oh, just do it for a year, and then you can step aside. So I just went, went back and said, okay, here's my, I actually handed my resignation letter to the board, signed. I said, here's my resignation letter. I'll do this for as long as you want, but whenever you're ready, whenever you find the guy to replace me, I, I'll help you recruit the guy to replace me. I will step aside and I will help out the new guy. And that was my commitment. And I spent most of my career trying to develop a replacement for me. And if you look, there's probably a couple of hundred former Sun execs who built Crawford Beverage and, and Bill McGowan, my HR guys, helped develop as I kept looking for somebody to replace me desperately for all of those years uh, and you know Eric Schmidt and Bill Coleman and Carol Bartz and you know Phil Samper and all these other people who came through there and ended up running something uh, probably 200 former Sun execs who became CEOs in the valley and around the world so guilty as charged I didn't ever really want to be CEO. And I remember when I finally did step down, I said to my wife, I finally know how to do CEO. I finally have it figured out. Things were running great. And I handed it off uh, to, uh, to Jonathan Schwartz and uh, stepped down. I had boys that were two, four, six, and eight at home. I'd been through all the battles. I'd seen all of the movies. And quite honestly, I was saying, you know, how much longer do I really want to keep doing this? I'd rather go home and raise my four startups at home and uh, so I stepped down, and five years later, uh, Oracle bought us. Yeah, you still, uh, I mean, in spite of that, you still work for 22 years as a CEO. That was the yeah, longest. That's, that that's a long time to be in the pinata. It's a young man's game, and, uh, you know, it was, I, I don't regret spending one minute at all with my boys. Right. So in 2004, mm -hmm. actually, Jonathan was promoted to a president COO, uh, and you were still CEO. Uh, how was that stage like? I mean, why did you choose Jonathan, for example? Um, he seemed like the, the best candidate for us, and uh, certainly I didn't do anything without the board approval and, and, and support, and uh, uh, he's a very bright guy, and 
understood the technologies and seemed, seemed to be the right guy to go do that. So he had a software background. Uh, so Everything's software. Hardware is software. Networking is software. Software is software. Computers are software. So, yeah. So uh, as against finding somebody from outside, you chose from within. I did. Yeah. Um, and uh, there were some other major acquisitions made at that time. Storage Tech was acquired in 2005 for $4.1 billion. I think there was, um, uh, at that time, there was the um, a time where I think you were in a panel, uh, the founder's panel at the museum. And you uh, actually uh, made some comments about, um, somebody asked a question, actually as to should they be, because they saw some of the uh, uncertainties, and they said, uh, you know, should I be holding on to the sun stock? And you made a very spirited uh, response, and you said um, uh, that, in, uh, that sun has like $4.5 billion in cash. This is right after this, the uh, storage tech acquisition. So you had $7 billion in cash, and, and you said that 17 years, the cash this means cash flow positive. There's only two uh, development communities, .NET and Java. You said the, there's only three OSs, Windows, Solaris, and Linux. Uh, PowerSpark and x86 are the only architectures. You have a large patent portfolio, and 36% of the archive data was in tape libraries because of storage tech. And then large product portfolio, partnership with Microsoft and Oracle and TI, high barrier to entry, as you said, um, and have enterprise servers suitable for grid. You said Google will not get into that, you know, that we have at Sun have the technology. So, um, you know, you were, you gave a very spirited um, answer and I think that was a very positive thing. A lot of people went away feeling very relieved. So did things change or uh, how did, I, you know, when I stepped down, I, I felt like the company was in good shape, but had obviously lots of strategic uh, challenges ahead of it. And did I want to go and transition the company to the, the next generation, or did I want to literally get out of the pinata? You know, I've been, it's been 30 plus years I'd been hammering away at this, and uh, working a bazillion hours and I had my wife at home with three, four young boys and I didn't think it was fair so I, I made a very personal decision, not a corporate decision, but I tried to do it when the company had 48.5% gross margins, was growing, had billions of dollars of cash in the bank, was gaining market share uh, and had a really solid team and you know I did the best I could in uh, preparing for, for you know the next generation but it wasn't without a lot of challenge. If you look at it all of the computer companies got wiped out, all of them, and none of them were able to transition. The only one who's actually been able to do that uh, has been Microsoft with the uh, desktop uh, position that they have. They've been able to build a Azure and build a, a, and be one of the top tier players in, in the cloud. The network is the computer. But nobody else was able to make that transition. And Oracle and SAP and all the rest of them are all trying and fighting to become a a cloud player, but you know it's it's Google, Amazon. Interestingly enough, it's a search company, a uh, book sales company, and Windows company that have made the transition to cloud. All the computer companies got wiped out. Right. So in terms of uh, cash, I think like I was saying, 4.1 billion dollar for storage tech, and then um, Jonathan was made CEO in April of 2006. And then MySQL was acquired uh, for one billion dollars. So there was still a continuing focus on open source, um, and so because there was no revenue as such for MySQL, right? Correct. So there was some revenue. Okay. But uh, it wasn't. So you, you know, agreed with that decision, for example, or? Uh, well, you know what you do when you step down as CEO is you let the new CEO. Uh, implement their strategy. I, you know, I, I wasn't going to get back in the pinata, and and uh, the board has to support the strategies until they don't. Okay. Right. Okay. So, did did you have? So you were uh, 
not driving from the back seat. You were basically letting the board be the decider. and the Well, the CEO decides, decide. the board approves the plans, right. and the board uh, makes sure that the right. assets aren't being misused. Right, so. right. And so uh, the Sun sale to Oracle happened in uh, 2009. So that was also interesting in that there was a lot of speculation because at that time, you know, there were HP and IBM and then finally Oracle. So can you share, because a lot of things have happened already, can you shed some light on what happened? What were the well, I think there were, you know, two final bidders and Oracle and IBM were both bidding for the business and Oracle, Larry Ellison came in with a deal that was in quote unquote always, according to our council, always better for the uh, Sun shareholders and employees than the IBM deal. So, uh, and then it went to a shareholder vote. And at this point, it's not the board or the CEO that makes the decision, it's a public company. Right. It's the shareholders and the shareholders decided that was right. a good deal. Right. So you had a, a very um, emotional goodbye to, the, to Sun when you left. And in fact, you said Sun in my mind should have been the great and surviving consolidator but I love the market economy and capitalism more than I love my company. Uh, the invisible hand is doing its thing quite efficiently, so I'm more than willing to accept this outcome. Uh, so uh, I guess you really believe in capitalism and the, so by, by the invisible hand, you meant the market forces. Exactly. Okay. We're a public company and uh, you know what I have, so few regrets. I don't have any, I, I mean, I wish I'd been smarter. <laughs> but um, I, I'm not at all ashamed. I'm incredibly proud of every employee, everything that they did, all of the hard work that they put in, the way they changed the industry. And uh, even though we got acquired, I think we exploded into all corners of the computer industry and the technology space today and our culture, our style, our thought processes, our technology, our wisdom has infiltrated so many other companies uh, that uh, we were like a virus that just uh, went into all corners and of the very con healthy technology virus. constellation. And very I think, ethical and healthy virus. Yeah, I mean, Sun went 30 some years without any, any hashtag anything yes. kinds of issues. Uh, there were never any um, Te technical or legal or ethical or moral breaches because we just played hard but played by the rules. I always said you want to break the rules of business but not the rule of law. Right. So in fact one of the questions I was going to ask you was what were the top three causes of Sun's success? I mean we already know that the, the people, the innovation uh, was one, the leadership that was shown. I think we shared in the success. We didn't try to have all of the success be in the hands of one person, employees, shareholders, partners, customer suppliers. We allowed everybody to share in the success. I think we were, we were very open with our interfaces, our source code, our partnerships, all the rest of it. So we were a very sharing company on that, on that front. And then um, I think we just enjoyed work we kick butt and had fun. And I would always tell people, listen, it is your job to have fun. If you're not having fun, sit down with your boss. It's 51% your responsibility to have fun, 49% your boss's, but sit down and say, I'm not having fun for the following reasons, and here's how it'd be more fun, and tell your boss, you know, Scott says I'm supposed to have fun, let's figure it out. And uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was okay to have fun. I was going to ask, uh, when did you first consider stepping down from your CEO job, but I think you already said that. The you day I took over, I, they had my, I don't know if that letter still exists or if anybody kept them. I, I think Ken Oshman uh, told me that they just ripped it up immediately and threw it in the trash can. But uh, that, that should be here at the Computer History Museum. So what were your greatest frustrations in driving some success? My greatest frustrations were probably what the board always told me, uh, that I hung on to people too long and didn't step into them because I never hired anybody I didn't like. I never promoted anybody I didn't like, so I always had a hard time 
letting Jones somebody letting go. somebody go, and I was just too nice that way. But I'm okay with that. We did all right. Right. So if you had to do it over again, would you change anything? For example, next person that you after you or anything? You know, that's such an unfair question. I just I have I've lived the most lucky life. I have I have been involved in the greatest industry of our times at the time when it was just absolutely exploding and doing wonderful things. I think we've touched just about every piece of technology that's out here today. Uh, we were earliest doing Google Glasses, wearable computing, uh, virtualization, open source, uh, risk, uh, you know, all of the things that we did uh, back then, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, we were in on the ground floor of all of that stuff. We have had such an impact. Uh, I just wished everybody literally yesterday happy birthday or two days ago happy birthday and my Twitter feed it just exploded with people saying this is this is absolutely the best and it's a, a, a it's a hundred thousand to one positive to negative uh, notes from everybody about this thing and I think if you talk to anybody who worked at Sun they will tell you it was the best place they ever worked. How could you possibly I wouldn't want to mess that up. I wouldn't want to go back to the Wayback Machine and screw that up because uh, it's just left the best taste in everybody's mouth. Thank you. In fact, cloud was, I still remember some of the drawings with the cloud drawings and so really the concept of cloud or open, uh, uh, it was really was there from the very beginning. And that was exactly why we did NFS. Yes. So that you could have computers talk to each other and uh, that started off back in 1982. I remember Bill Joy walking in and telling the board we're going to open source NFS and give it away to all our competitors and they looked at him like he was nuts and he said what good is a telephone that doesn't connect to any other phones and uh, that's that's really the that was the the heart of Sun Microsystems sharing opening up and moving the ball forward. Right and um, one question that was asked is, in many instances, what you and the Sun team did were ahead of the game. And uh, there were significant uh, behavior changes were needed to make that happen. For example, in Sunray. Uh, did you realize that uh, if you had to do it over again, would you include the inertia factor in your planning? Oh my gosh. There are so many things with hindsight that you would try to do differently, but I spend zero time looking in the rear view mirror and every time, all the time looking in the windshield. Um, you know, sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug and you know, just by looking out the windshield you try and be the windshield. And so I really don't, I, I, just, I just don't like to look back and uh, feel bad at myself. I like to look forward and say, hey, I've learned and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna do better. And so I'm spending a lot of time advising companies now and uh, sharing with them those those particulars as they're appropriate to their business. Right. So you are pretty uh, outspoken about privacy. Uh, you know, get over it. Um, I had a question, uh, privacy versus security. Would you like to comment on the significance of that? Well, I've ob obviously said privacy, um, uh, you have no privacy, get over it. That's probably my most famous quote. One that I don't get quoted on as much is, absolute anonymity breeds irresponsibility and I truly believe that uh, but I will also share with you that I am way less concerned about private enterprise having my data than I am big government or even small government having my data and especially in the era of scope creep of the local state and federal governments as they regulate more they get more involved in healthcare, education, finance, loans, uh, uh, tax audits, all of the things that they're getting involved in. It scares me to death when the government has my data because you talk about security, well, I'm mostly worried about the government and my security. Uh, and so I, I think all of the efforts by bureaucrats to make sure that a Facebook or a Google or somebody doesn't do something bad with your data is misplaced. I think they should be looking in the mirror and say, what happens if, 
you know, we have a FISA warrant or if we have a, 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 a IRS that is, you know, getting political and, and those are the are what happens when health care or who gets into college or who has to pay off their loans becomes a political decision and that's where how did you vote, what is your persuasion in this, that or the other thing becomes a very scary thing for the government to have. They're the dangerous ones. Um, a couple of questions about the, uh, there were some uh, acquisitions like at one stage uh, Sun was looking at acquiring Apple, I know you've spoken about it, uh, it came close to I maybe mean, six times or something. <laughs> Uh, maybe comment on that, and then was there also um, there was speculation about Silicon Graphics? That there was a time when Sun and Silicon Graphics were talking. I don't think there was a company in the industry that we didn't talk to about merging with, or buying, or getting a strategic investment in, or partnering, or whatever. Those conversations happened all the time. Uh, I remember Ken Olson walking me down the hall of a hotel and putting his arm around me and says, "You know, you really ought to drop Spark and Solaris and go with." Alpha and Vax, and I said thank you, and you know, and then we could buy you, and oh, thank you, Ken, but no, thank you. Uh, and yeah, we had many conversations with Apple, we had conversations with IBM. I even went to Oracle back in the early, early days and said, Larry, we should combine. I'll do the hardware, you do the software, and he said no, and he could have had us for a lot less back then. But uh, you know, as I always said about Apple, it's probably good I didn't get a hold of it because there's never been. Uh, the, there's never been an entrepreneur like Steve Jobs and he's the greatest of all time. I have the utmost respect for what he accomplished without government help, without uh, just fundamentally through the persuasion and commitment and brilliance that he was. He was, he was the greatest uh, entrepreneur of all time. So. Right. So uh, before we move on I would have screwed to, it up if we'd bought Apple, is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, you've said that. Yeah. So uh, before we move on, uh, any other thoughts on Sun? Because it was such a tremendous uh, operation, and uh, what you accomplished is just uh, really uh, very unique and uh, unparalleled. So, so, you know, let's go Lion King circle of life on this thing. Companies have their life cycles. Uh, some don't, some keep sticking around even though they don't necessarily innovate as much or they aren't as creative or they're very high cost or whatever, they establish such strong market positions. They do very well as capitalists for their shareholders, but they aren't necessarily moving the ball forward and they might actually slow things down. Sun with its open interfaces, open source, shared uh, environment and zero barrier to exit actually made it pretty easy for customers to move off of us, which is actually a good thing because technology has the shelf life of a banana. So not only were we a, a, a good company from a shareholder perspective, but we were a very good company in terms of a steward of the technology and the customers that we brought into our portfolio. So I don't feel badly about it at all. And I don't think we get credit for being zero barrier to exit and not locking people in and costing them a huge bag of money. There's still people stuck on mainframes. There's still people on windows that should be on a new and a different environment. There's still people uh, on lots of legacy environments and uh, getting people to move off of uh, a browser or a social media environment is very, very hard now because they make it very sticky and sticky isn't necessarily good for the customer. It may be good for the company and the shareholders and the CEO, but it isn't good for the customer. So I literally go to bed every night thinking, well, we did the right thing by our customers. By If we didn't perform or we moved in a different direction, we didn't, we didn't mess with our customers. And I think there's a lot of customers and a lot of employees who feel very good about the way we handled ourselves out in the marketplace. Yes, well, as you said, I think all the former Sun people are very proud of the company and, uh, and always reminisce about uh, those days. Uh, we have preserved the legacy very well in the museum. Uh, we, of course, have done the technical panels and the business panels, celebration up to 25 years. So those are all available. Uh, plus, we have uh, donated, or Sun had donated Oracle 
uh, all of the chips, you know, every single chip, uh, in fact, very unique. I don't think even IBM or Intel has that. Uh, I was personally involved with that, so every single chip is very in the cool. permanent exhibit. Very cool. Uh, so moving on, um, you know, you started Kariki. Uh, in fact, even when you were still at um, Sun, uh, can you say a few words about it? This is a free online K-12 education um, service. Right. So Kim Jones, who was running our education business at Sun and I were in Europe and we were talking about how we were open sourcing everything, but I was spending $130 on a third grade math textbook for my oldest son and I said, what's up with that? 10 plus 10 was, is, and will be 20 forever. Well, Nothing's changed since Newton got hit on the head with an apple, and we did some research. Eight to fifteen billion dollars a year annually, once a year, spent on K through 12 educational materials, and we thought, let's open source that. And so we created the largest open source community and repository at Curriculum. It started off as the global education learning, uh, learning committee or council or whatever, uh, and we spun it out and created a Curriculum, a curriculum wiki and uh, Kim is running that now and we decided to uh, just go big time with it and, and eventually we're going to uh, launch a free online open source uh, multimedia web enabled real time scored on demand um, push to talk to talk to a teacher internationalized localized and certified K through 12 experience to allow no child parent or teacher to be held back and flipping the classroom, we think, with real-time scoring and gamification is going to change education much in the same way that we changed the internet and that Uber changed cabs and uh, other companies. So uh, you've heard about Khan Academy, right? So we were one of the first distributors. We were, because Khan was on YouTube, it was blocked in schools, but we're a curated, moderated site, so Khan stuff could run, so we have that, and. 275,000 other learning assets on our website. Right, wonderful. A friend of mine actually is doing the same thing in the college domain. And so it will be interesting to get his views and I will forward those to you. Cool. Um, and then in 2011, you co-founded WayIn, uh, which is a digital marketing company in the cloud share domain, cloud space, uh, social, uh, social intelligence and visualization. So maybe say a few words about that. So weigh-in is all about uh, zero-party data. Third-party data is today sort of kryptonite. You don't want to go near it. And Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook thing has gotten everybody very wary about people using your data and selling it to third parties. First-party data is what you capture at point of sale or in your store or wherever. Uh, and people understand first party data is being captured, but zero party data is explicit engagement data captured online in the form of a sweepstakes or a contest or a product um, a configurator or this, that, or the other thing where the consumer is sharing data and getting something in return like winning a, a chance to win a house or a, uh, a discount on a burger or some other thing. So. Uh, these uh, these zero party data uh, experiences that we create at weigh in we have uh, nearly a hundred of them that can be prefabbed and, and launched online give you access to zero party data which is a much more responsible way of gathering consumer information it's automatically opt-in and you're getting compensated for sharing that data so it's a it's doing very very well and we're very excited about it good so you're no longer the CEO, I think you moved on. I did that for a little while temporarily yeah. until we found a real good one because it's a young man's game. Good. So uh, I understand that you're also involved with many other investments. Uh, so anything uh, you want to talk about? Also I'd like to get your views about your recommendation to somebody who's starting a career. So. Um, you know, I'm advising lots of companies. I advise for stock. I don't go as an employee. I don't ask for salary. I don't ask for um, a title or whatever. I just quietly help people out with no commitment, and uh, if they pay me stock. You know, the more stock you pay, the probably the quicker I'll answer your email, and it's not going to change my life, but I don't know how else to prioritize my time. I just love 
it's like business school case studies that are real and they really matter and I love helping little young capitalists get going and so anything I can do to help so I help from the very largest companies the very largest telephone and consumer companies all the way down to two-person startups and uh, it keeps me in the game and and I can use my wisdom without having to uh, get up and drive into the office every day and interview somebody so that's that's what I'm doing my advice to young people is protect the private sector the private sector is where innovation happens it's where personal responsibility is rewarded it is where you're without financial freedoms and liberties you will not have social freedoms and liberties and the new young groups are so focused on social justice and on equity and on victimhood and all the rest of it let me tell you the economic wars that we fought have a byproduct of employment training taxes, goods and services, innovation, and self-esteem. Redistribution destroys all of that. And so my advice to all of the new startups is protect the private sector, trim back, limit, and stifle the growth in the state, federal, and local governments, because they will destroy the opportunity for the great American dream. And I don't think people understand that. Most of them have been educated by government schools, government sector union teachers, and tenured professors. And government schools and tenured professors will teach you not about the private sector, but the government sector. And I think they're all massively misdirected in their education. So I worry, I worry as we hurtle towards 50% of the GDP into the government sector, and as we have two-thirds of the federal budget being redistribution where we take money from those who earned it legally and give it to those who didn't to corruptly buy votes and to stay in power. So that's, that's my advice to you is as your head's down being non-political or being socially justified, you're letting the private sector slip away and then it's not going to be pretty. Thank you. Um, you have four boys. I think you're very proud of their achievement. Maybe you can say a few words about them. You know, they're all young and they haven't really achieved. I'm very proud of their comportment, their sense of duty, their personal responsibility focus. Uh, they're gentlemen, they're polite, they're respectful, they're humble, and they're incredibly hardworking uh, and honest and high integrity. And whether they succeed or not, uh, is not important. It's how they're playing the game and how they're how they're uh, they're going about it. I couldn't be more proud of them. I'm happy for their successes, uh, but you know they're still very young. The oldest is only 23. Uh, the youngest is heading off to uh, college next year. So uh, I think they're very well set up to uh, make a positive impact on this world. They've done very well in golf. They're all good golfers. They're all good hockey players. Three of them are second degree uh, taekwondo black belts. Uh, they're all um, straight A students because mom won't feed them if they don't get straight A. So, uh, you know, they want dinner. You, if you want to play sports, you better be a good, a good student. So, what are your, uh, what do you do for leisure? I know you used to go yachting at one point. Uh, I never was a yachter. I was. I used to play hockey. I stopped that at the age of 55. Too many broken bones and blood clots and stuff like that. Thought I was kind of dumb to kill myself playing hockey. I still play golf. My handicap is rising like the sun stock price used to. And uh, But, you know, I really, I'm doing all this advisory work. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to empty nesting with my wife and doing a little bit of travel where I don't have to sit in conference rooms the whole time and go see the world as a tourist a little bit. Uh, but fundamentally, I have 4,300 emails in my stack of people I'm advising and companies I'm trying to help. And when I when I have the energy, I sit down and I plow through those and I try and help as many companies as I can. I love capitalism. I love the private sector. I love, uh, I love the economic war that has the only casualty is all of those things I talked about, you know, all of the things that happen when, uh, when companies compete. It's a great way. It's not like physical war where there really truly is carnage. 
uh, and, and listening to these politicians who want no carnage in the economic wars, they don't understand that that's, that's what develops us, that's what gives us wisdom, and that's what creates winners. And uh, without winners, uh, show me a geography with no billionaires and I'll show you a very poor geography. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you, sir.